There we go. Can you see the PowerPoints? Yeah, I can see them. Okay, good. All right, let me turn that into a slideshow. Come on. Slideshow. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to move some things around here so I can see what I'm doing. All right. <clears throat> So we're going to look at uh, chapter two today on measurements and calculations. Fundamental stuff for actually most of the sciences. Uh, no, I think I can say all the sciences are involved and require knowledge of how to make measurements and how to manipulate those measurements, how to do calculations to get useful information out of them. And this is just a general outline of what we're going to look at today. Okay. So, um, with a measurement, we're talking about a quantitative observation. That's quantitative versus qualitative. Okay. Um, think about quantitative as quantity. You're trying to, to, your observation involves a number of some kind. That's what quantitative means. Qualitative is more like a, a general description, like what's the color? Um, what do you observe? Like, do you see uh, precipitation in your solution when you add two together? Or, um, General, I mean, even if you're looking at uh, almost semi-quantitative, that is, you're getting close, but you're really not hard numbers yet. You could say one's falling faster than the other. That's a qualitative. But quantitative requires uh, a measurement of a number and a unit of measure. The number by itself is meaningless for a measurement. So if I were to say that's um, that's twelve, what does that mean? You know, it's twelve. Twelve what? Twelve inches? Yeah, it was about twelve inches. But if I had said it's twelve meters, I would have been wrong, because twelve meters would be like from here to the other side of my house. <clears throat> so you need the unit of measure to qualify what the number means. <clears throat> and once you've uh, identified or associated your number with a measurement, um, that measurement is, is, is valid for whatever you measured. Now, whatever you measured, it could care less what the units of measure are, right? Like I was saying last time we met, nature is nature. And science is just trying to explain what it's doing. Nature just does what it does. So when we make a measurement, um, nature knows that it's that long. It doesn't care what the values are. But if we say it's 12 inches long, we could also say um, it's um, 25 centimeters, roughly. Right? Two different units of measure change the value of the number. And in the process of going through this chapter, I'm going to introduce some concepts on how do you convert from one unit of measure to the other and, and at the same time get the right uh, number associated with those units. Because we could say 12 inches or 25 centimeters, it's still the same length. It's just we're using a different measurement system uh, to describe it. Oh, I got an itchy nose today. Let's see, what is that? Somebody talking about me? Uh, itchy palm, is you going to get money? Or is it itchy ears? Somebody's talking about you. What's itchy nose? I think it's the ears. Yeah. That's about you. 
somebody's talking about you. And itchy nose is you're going to have visitors, maybe. Mm. I can't remember all my old wives' tales. <clears throat> okay, so we have a quantitative observation that requires a number and a unit. Um, often referred to as the scale. So anytime a number has a unit of measure associated with it, we call it a scalar or a scalar quantity. There are instances where you will have pure numbers, just the number and nothing else. But those are not measurements. Those are usually, those result from calculations. And remember in algebra, if you have uh, a number and a unit, that if you have the same unit in the numerator and the denominator with some number up here, we'll just make something up. If you divide those two, you get one half, and that's it, because the units cancel. So in that case, you can have a pure number, but unless you know where it came from, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. So it's not that pure numbers can exist, it's just that whenever you make a measurement, you have to have both units and scale. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see, it's not, there it goes. Okay, so um, very often in the sciences, and now we're speaking in general, not just chemistry, but all sciences, we make measurements <clears throat> and sometimes the numbers are very, very large. And if we use standard notation, which is what what this number represents, 93 million. If we use standard notation, they can take up half a page. So we need some way to condense those numbers so we still, so they still retain all their information, but they're more compact, they're easier to hang on. It's kind of like um, uh, compression, data compression, when you have, um, everybody understands um, uh, music files. Lots of times they're in uh, CDA or, or WAVE format, and those are uncompressed. Now, there's all the information is, is there, and they're huge files. But if you want to carry them around, if you want to make them portable, you need to compress them. But you want to retain as much of that information as possible when you compress them. So we developed the MP3 format for music. So you could put it on a small, um, what do they call those things? We used to call them Walkmans, but now they're they're I, iTunes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in order to get all that information in there, you have to compress them. Well, this is a form of compression where we take this large number and we convert it into something that's more manageable. Now, this is exponential notation. And exponential notation for um, our system, which is a decimal system, is everything is based on units of 10, right? So when we have a number like 93 million, this is the ones position. So anything in there is times one. We could have, if we had a three in there, it'd be just the number three. This is the tens position. So anything in that position is times 10. So if we had a one in there, that would be 10. And if we had a, a, a one here and a two there, that would be 10 plus two is 12. And this is the hundreds position. This is the thousands and so forth. Right? This is the millions and this is the tens of millions position. So since everything is decimal based, we can convert that number into something times a power of 10 because each time you move over, you can store that position in a power of 10. If we just move the decimal from here, see there's an understood decimal there. If we move it over, right, that reduces the size of this number. And then right, we've stored that position here. But if we move the decimal another position, we would say times 10 to the second power. We move to two, two places. So if we moved all the way over, 
it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten to the seven. And then the decimal would be here. And that would be your exponential notation. Now, why do I say exponential when the slide says scientific? Okay, there's a fine distinction, but an important one between exponential and scientific notation. Mm -hmm. Exponential notation, all it requires is a power of 10. So we could move the decimal place over one, two, three, and then we would say 93,000 times 10 to the third. That would be an equivalent expression of this number and it's exponential because we have a portion of it as an exponent of 10. But that's not scientific notation. Scientific notation requires that this part of the number, which is called the coefficient, the coefficient must be between 1 and 10. Okay? So if you get to 10, then you go to the next exponent and then the number, the coefficient becomes one. So 9.3 is less than 10, greater than one. That is scientific notation. It's also exponential notation, but it's a subcategory, special case, scientific notation. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> and there it is in print. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, and I told you, what happens if the coefficient is exactly 10? This part right here, if that's 10, then mm -hmm. you take that, that power of 10 and store it over here as an increase in this one, in this case. And then this number becomes 1. So it's 1 times 10 to whatever. Okay. Okay. Any number in our system, in our decimal system, can be represented as a product of that coefficient times a power of 10. And that makes uh, it possible to take huge numbers, as our example, and shrink them down into something more manageable. <clears throat> but it's not just huge numbers, large numbers. You can have very, very, very small numbers also for instance, what if our number is very, very small? Now, we're leaving out the units of measure here because we're just talking about numbers. But uh, if you were to make a measurement, all of these examples would have some scalar unit attached to it. 93 million uh, brings to mind the distance from the sun, average distance of the sun to the earth. Okay, it'd be 93 million miles. If that were kilometers, it would be a different number. But we can also have very small numbers. Uh, for instance, I just make something up. Okay, so there's our number, a decimal number. That's very small. You know that because it's way to the right. Lots of zeros between the decimal and the non-zero numbers. Mm. So the, how do you store powers of 10 there? Well, in this case, the powers of 10 will be negative. When you move the decimal place from the right to the left, you're making the coefficient smaller, so the powers of 10 have to be larger. But in this case, we're moving the decimal to the right, and we're making the coefficient larger, so the powers of 10 have to get smaller which means negative numbers. So in this case, we move one, two, three, four. Now, what's the power of 10? Well, one, two, three, four is negative four. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important that we also know how to go backwards and forwards between these two 
because sometimes you want to express your value in standard notation. Uh, for if for no other reason, maybe aesthetics, it looks better that way. <clears throat> or when you're comparing a list of numbers, uh, if they have different exponents, then it's, it's hard to see a relationship among them. So if you make them all the same power of 10, or if you just change them all to standard notation, then the comparison is easier to make. So in order to change this back, you just start here and to get rid of those, you move to the left. Four places. With our 93 million, 9.3, you move seven places to the right. And as you go, you add zeros because they're placeholders. In this system, the zero is a placeholder. If you don't have the zero to hold the place, then the number is different. It's not right. Let's say, for example, we had a zero here. Right? The first number meant this, but this one is 3.402 times 10 to the minus four. Those are two different numbers because that zero is in there. Okay, it's, it's in this position. This is tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So instead of two hundredths, it's two thousandths. There's a difference in those two numbers because the zero holds that place. Okay, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this is just in print what I just said. Which direction do you move the decimal place? And to check yourself, I always say, when you answer a question, ask yourself, is that answer reasonable? Right? If I said, um, if I calculated the volume of a bacterial uh, cell, okay? And I said, the volume of that bacterial cell, and I'm using units of measure of centimeters. If I said it's 93 million centimeters, uh, cubic centimeters, excuse me, because we're volume, mm -hmm. then is that reasonable? <laughs> no, because a centimeter is about that big, and 93 million of them, your bacterial cell should be that big, right? So it's not reasonable. <clears throat> so always ask yourself when you when you calculate <clears throat> um, an answer to a question, is the answer reasonable? <clears throat> and the same thing you do with uh, changing standard notation to scientific notation. Is it reasonable? Right. If I said that this number. Um, in standard notation, all right, we determined that. And then I said, this, I said one, two, three. If I said this, what would that mean? 3.4 times 10 to the third is uh, 3,420. That's not the same as this, right? So that's not reasonable. We made a mistake. It should be minus three, okay? So if you keep that in the back of your mind, say, is the answer reasonable? Then it'll keep you from making lots of dumb errors. It helps me all the time. And if you do it enough, you sort of get in the habit. <clears throat> if you watch any of my old videos where I'm standing at the board uh, in the classroom and working problems, then you may see me occasionally stop scratch my head and look at the board and say something like, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, I caught myself in an error because it was developing into something unreasonable. So I fix it on the spot. And <clears throat> try not to be embarrassed. Okay. Um, this is another expression. You know, what do you do when you move the decimal a certain place? Uh, even though the decimal is not here explicitly, it's understood to be there. And later on, we're going to say there's a difference between an understood decimal and an explicit decimal. Right? 
if the if this value is a non-zero number, it doesn't matter. Uh, understood is as good as explicit. But if there's a zero involved, then there's a difference between the two. And I'll point that out when we get to it. Uh, okay. Let's see. Which of these following um, ex correctly expresses 7,882 scientific notation? Okay. So we have these choices. So where's the decimal point? It's right there, right? So which way are you going to move it? Well, we end, need to end up with a coefficient that's between 1 and 10, so we have to move it to the left, right? So we move it three places to the left. Oh, accidentally clicked that one the wrong way. And three places to the left stores up positive energy or positive value into the power of 10. So three positions is a power of three, not a power of minus three. And of course, um, the coefficient is right here, but the power is wrong. And the power is right here, but the coefficient is wrong. And the coefficient is wrong, uh, the power is wrong here too. So this is the only one that meets all the conditions. And that also goes back to test taking technique. When you have multiple choice questions, uh, process of elimination helps narrow the choices. Uh, ideally, you can work the problem and then look for the answer in the choices. But if you're, if you're kind of struggling, then test taking techniques of multiple choice can help. Okay, here's another example. In this case, which way is the decimal going to move? To the right, which means the powers of 10 were going to be negative. So it's got to move one, two, three, four, five positions to the right, which means negative five. And test taking technique says that this is the power of five, negative five, so that has to be the answer. And we check ourselves. Right, what's the coefficient? The coefficient should have the decimal here, right? 4.96 and the powers of 10 there. So that's our choice. Okay. Uh, let's see, We're this is a little bit of a review. You have the number and the unit, uh, different examples. Now, what possible units could there be? The sky is the limit any unit that scientists agree upon among themselves and establish a standard is a fair unit, right? Um, 20 uh, gulams, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything because we haven't agreed upon what a gulam is, right? But we have agreed upon what a gram represents. So that's a valid unit. Uh, and in fact, it's a unit of mass. How much substance do you have? We have 20 grams. Um, but the units don't necessarily have to be single words like grams. They can be combinations of units like this one with a joule. Joule is a unit of energy. And second, of course, is a unit of time measurement. Now, normally when you make a measurement, you'll only have one unit. So what typically happens is if you have multiple unit uh, associated with the, or a complex unit, I should say, associated with the number, it's usually due to a calculation where you multiply two numbers together with different units. One unit was joules and the other unit value was in seconds. Then when you multiply them together, the units combine, right? Joule seconds. Or here's this, this one may be easier to understand. If we want to know what's the area of a rectangle, and let's say the rectangle has uh, 12 centimeters in this direction and six centimeters in that direction. I'll say, I see we've got another guest. All right, Melinda made it. Okay, 
I just don't. I see you now. Okay. Glad to see you finally made it. So what would the area be here? Well, the area is uh, width times height, right? So 12 times 6 is 72. So that's this one times this one. But you also multiply the units together, right? Centimeters times centimeters is what? Centimeters squared. Okay. <clears throat> so by doing this calculation, we have changed the unit of measure from a linear unit to an area unit, square centimeters. Okay. We could do the same thing with a volume. If we had a depth multiplied by that, then we get centimeters cubed. So these, um, whenever you multi, when you uh, process two or more numbers and they have units with them, then the, the units also combine in an algebraic, uh, algebraically valid process. Right? You don't just multiply or divide or whatever you do to the numbers. You also do it to the units. Okay, so what are those units that we've agreed upon? Well, we have fundamental units, those that have a standard of measure that's agreed upon, and it might even be um, reside in some country under armed guard <laughs> because that's our standard and we don't want anybody tampering with it. So that's the case with the kilogram. The kilogram is our standard of measure of mass, and it's in some cave in France, inside two bell jars, one little one and one big one, and the atmosphere in there is is uh, is filled with, um, I think, argon, some atmosphere that will not corrode. The cylinder itself is made out of an alloy of platinum and iridium, which makes it very stable also, it will not corrode. But that mass is agreed upon by the International Community of Scientists, and it's an SI unit for the System International, that's French for International System. And whenever we need, we need to uh, validate a mass that we're saying is one kilogram, for instance, we have to take it to France and they have to remove it from the bell jar and compare it on a balance and make sure that ours is one kilogram compared to the standard. Then they put it back in the bell jar and flush it out and we take our mass home and we um, profit by it, <clears throat> right? So that's mass. There are other standards. The standard of length is the meter, right? That was originally based upon uh, the average distance between the equator and the North Pole along the surface of the Earth. And then they chopped it into uh, small pieces until they got something that was manageable. That's the meter. Nowadays, the meter can be uh, determined accurately if you have the right equipment. So you don't have to go to that cave in France and get that meter length of platinum meridium alloy and compare to it. <clears throat> Standardized equipment now can do it based upon <clears throat> the number of wavelengths of a particular uh, light coming from a laser. So that's the fundamental unit of length. The fundamental unit of time is the second the fundamental unit of temperature is the Kelvin. Now, <clears throat> the Kelvin is uh, based upon a gas theory. And we'll talk about that when we get to gases, <clears throat> maybe even sooner, actually. But um, the unit of measure, the Kelvin, is the exact same size as the unit of measure of degree centigrade. 
or Celsius. I can't remember what they're calling it these days. Degree C. Same size measure. So if you have uh, that number there and that number there, that's the same expression with different units, but the units are equal in size, so they're interchangeable. <clears throat> um, we're not going to be we're not going to be messing with uh, electric current, the ampere, not <clears throat> not in this class. So you don't have to worry about that one. But we are going to be using this one. The amount of a substance is the mole. Right? And we'll define the mole later. Okay. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Say so these are fundamental units. All other units that scientists use are derived from these units. Okay. So I'm sorry, you just said we're not using the um, electric current. Right. We won't use that one. Okay. Yeah. We, we will make reference to uh, one, two, three, four, five, the other five. <clears throat> <clears throat> so in order to change the size of the unit from fundamental to some derived, we need a prefix in front of that unit. So let's say we have, um, we're using our standard unit of meters. But the distance um, between, say, uh, Beckley and Charleston, we know, well, let's just say it's roughly, I don't know, depending on where you go, 60 miles. Let's just use 60 miles. Um, 60 miles would be in the neighborhood of uh, about 95 kilometers. Okay. Now, instead of saying 95,000 meters, I just said 95 kilometers. How can I do that? Because that K in front of the M changes the unit from this size to this size. Okay. The little K means kilo. And kilo says you multiply this one times a thousand and you get your new unit of measure, okay? That's a derived unit of measure. Um, if we wanted to go small, say I wanted to describe the, um, let's say an inch. Well, an inch happens to be 2.54 centimeters, right? What would that be in meters? Well, it depends on what the C means. And you'll notice down here, the little C means centi, which is one hundredth of, 10 to the minus two, one hundredth of a meter. So if the meter is this long, the centimeter would be about that long. It would take 100 of them to make a meter. Okay, is that giving anybody trouble? Mm -hmm. This unit conversions um, are essential. You need to understand what these prefixes mean. Um, I would focus on the kilo, the centi, the milli. Uh, micro and nano are important also. So the milli is one thousandth of a millimeter. It's a thousandth of a meter. A micro is 10 to the minus sixth meter. Or a mil, um, yeah, a millionth of a meter. And then the nano, the nanometer, you've heard of nanotechnology. It's based upon the size of the particles that are being manipulated. So when they make sports clothing with nanoparticles in them, like uh, uh, this product they call Copper Fit, they take nanoparticles of copper and embed them in the fibers. And they provide some antimicrobial benefits. But those size of those particles are a billionth of a meter, right? They're, they're so small, you need a microscope to find them. 
Now we could go, that's going small. We could go big, like I did with a kilometer. The kilo means a thousand based on the meter. Um, and these are examples. The decimeter is a tenth of a meter, right? So it would be like um, maybe here. If that were a meter, of course. <clears throat> And you need to understand, you need to, I guess you just have to memorize. Memorize what those prefixes mean. Now, um, these derived units can also be used in calculations, right? Like I did with the centimeter to be centimeter squared. But volume, we also need a standardized unit and it's based upon the fundamental units. All you have to do is take a length and cube it, right? A meter times a meter times a meter is a cubic meter. So here's one cubic meter. That could be a derived unit of volume. But if we take um, a cubic decimeter out of that right here, like that, that cubic decimeter is given a special name. It's called a liter. That's what the big L stands for. And everywhere else in the, in the world, I think, uh, uses volume expressions in terms of, this is the metric system, liters. In this country, of course, we, we don't buy liters of gasoline, we buy gallons of gasoline. But they're related. Remember what I said about nature? This volume, nature doesn't care what you call it, it knows this is a certain volume. So if this volume is like a gallon jug, full of gasoline or milk or whatever, then it's also in different units, a different number. So one gallon is also 3.8 liters, right? It's still the same volume. We just gave it a different unit of measure. So the number had to change. And the other standard uh, a unit of measure that you will probably be encountering, particularly if you're in the medical profession, is the milliliter. Right? They used to call it CC or cubic centimeter. And, and some equipment uh, and measuring devices in the medical profession still use CC. So CM to the third power is cubic centimeter. And that is equal to CC. Now, why did they do that? Well, in days gone by, it was hard to label uh, bags of whatever or containers of different fluids with this superscript, CM to the third, centimeters cubed. So they use CC. They don't have to use powers. They don't have to use uh, exponents. And it's easier to label your stuff. So that's why medical profession prefers CCs. But now since we've standardized milliliters as our unit of measure, and they're exactly equal to one another. So that is the same size as the milliliter. So if you have a number of these, you've got the same number of the milliliters. All right. Um, so that begs the question, how many milliliters are there in a liter? Well, the liter itself is a derived unit, right, from the standard length, the fundamental length. Well, what we do is we derive the decimeter first, then we der derive the liter, <laughs> and now we're going to derive the milliliter from the liter. So milli is one thousandth of a liter. So that means in a liter you have one thousand milliliters. Okay. And most laboratory equipment, um, some of it is calibrated in liters. Some large volumes are, but most of your uh, measuring devices in the laboratory 
are calibrated in milliliters for volume. Now we talk about mass, right? This is an analytical balance and it looks to me like it's uh, accurate to four decimal places, right? So it's uh, very accurate. And that's why it has uh, walls on the side and a roof, right? Because air currents will disturb and, and throw your measurement off. So you have to close the doors and let it settle down, let the air currents settle before you can make an accurate measurement at that uh, many decimal places. So measuring mass is how much of it do you have? The fundamental unit is the kilogram. Now that begs the question, that has a prefix in it, right? Kilo, kilo means a thousand. So the, the SI unit is a thousand grams. So that says to me that the gram came first. Well, here's the story. When they were trying to come up with a standard unit of mass, a gram is like, like that of that metal. It's too small. If it's only very slightly corroded or it gets scratched, that's a huge percentage error introduced into that standard of measure. So I said, wait a minute, we need something bigger. Everybody, alchemists from centuries before have been using the gram, right? So we're kind of stuck with it. So I said, okay, we'll keep the gram, but we're gonna standardize the unit of mass of a larger size so that if the slightest bit of corrosion occurs, it won't throw off the total by a large percentage. So they said, okay, let's take a thousand grams. That's a pretty good size mass. And it's, it's, we can handle it fa fairly easily. We can, it's portable, um, but it's very stable. So that's why the kilogram is the standard. And if you, if you take the kilo off of it, and you get the gram. And the gram is one thousandth of a kilogram. And a kilogram is one thousand grams. Now, like I said before, if you have something that weighs a kilogram, that standard measure, the cylinder, um, it just is. We're saying that's a kilogram, but if we use a different unit of measure, it's also 2.2 pounds, okay? So there you have an equivalence. That same item in this system is a kilogram and in this system is 2.2 pounds. So we can say that they're equal because they represent the exact same mass. And it's important to see that equivalence because we're gonna use that equivalence in a little bit. Yeah, I think we're going to do it. Hopefully, we've got another hour. Use that equivalence to start making conversions of one unit of measure to another, and how does it affect the number that goes with it? Um, you could say it another way. A pound is 453 grams. Okay. Which uh, contain improper uses of commonly used units? A gallon of milk is equal to about four liters of milk. That's true. That's actually 3.8 liters, but roughly if you round it off, and we'll talk about rounding also uh, a little bit later, a 200 pound man has a mass of 90 kilograms. Is that reasonable? Well, what's the relationship? 2.2 times 90 is what? Well, two times 90 is 180, and uh, a tenth of 90 is nine times two is 18. Yeah, it's pretty close to 200 pounds, right? That's reasonable. What I just did was estimate, and that's a good habit to get into also. You can estimate an answer 
and within an order of magnitude, uh, determine if the answer is reasonable. Now, just use the term there. I don't know if you've ever heard it before, order of magnitude. Order so of to mag estimate the man, you did um, 2.2 times 90 to C, if it was right? Yeah, yeah. Where'd the 2.2 come from? Oh, uh, let's go backwards. Right here, one kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. Uh, like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I missed that one. So 2.2 .2 times 90 kilograms is about 200. How about this? And a basketball player has a height of seven meters. So how, how much is a meter? Well, it's a little more than a yard, right? It's 39.36 inches. So if a yard is here, a meter is like, like that. So if your basketball player is seven meters tall, right, he'd be like, <laughs> he'd be like uh, uh, about 24 feet tall. That's not reasonable, right? Even the tallest basketball players are no more than eight feet tall. So that's less than three meters, two and a half meters or so. How about a nickel is 6.5 centimeters thick? So how much is a centimeter? Well, a centimeter, if an inch is 2.54 centimeters, then you shrink it down two and a half times, about like that is a centimeter. So six and a half centimeters would be six and a half times that would be about like that. Right? So mm -hmm. there we go. So are nickels that thick? No, <laughs> that's not a reasonable. That's not a reasonable value. Now, 6.5 millimeters, now you're getting closer because the millimeter is a smaller unit of measure. Okay, so those two don't make any sense. All right, here's a concept that even practicing research scientists fail to appreciate on occasion is the the fact that every measurement you make carries with it a certain amount of uncertainty get that a certain amount of uncertainty every measurement is uncertain which means error right some error is obvious Right, if I take a ruler and I lay it out uh, against something and I say, okay, uh, how long is that something? So I read it off on the ruler and maybe I'm looking at it at the wrong angle, like this. So I read it wrong. That's a source of error and uncertainty. Or maybe the markings on the ruler have been smudged. Uh, over time, they've been worn. And it's really hard to tell which one's which. Another source of error. So if somebody else came along and made the same measurement, they might give me a different number. Mm -hmm. So every measurement carries with it uncertainty. Just that that's a universal law. Now, like I said before, whatever's being measured, it just is. It doesn't care what you're doing to measure it. But when you start to measure something, then you're automatically introducing uncertainty. So we need to know how to deal with uncertainty as best we can. Uh, some, some types of measurements and calculations um, can be done with very minimal uncertainty. Others have large amounts of uncertainty. So we need to do the best we can to minimize the uncertainty where possible. So here's the first rule or standard for scientists. When a scientist sees a number <clears throat> like, um, let's say that number, 2,567, they understand that each digit 
is designated as either certain or uncertain. So that is the certain digits, um, they're, they're hard and fast. You know that they're not gonna change. Those are the certain parts of the number, but there are uncertain parts. And the uncertain part is always assumed to be the last digit. Okay, so when you make a measurement, another, another word for uncertain is guess. I'm taking a guess about that last number. So when you make a measurement, be sure to include the last digit is a guess, an estimate. So if you have, uh, uh, your measuring device has markings on it. Major markings, minor markings, right? So if you're comparing it to something like for length and it's right in here, like that, yeah, I hope I didn't draw that too small. Then you would say it's this many units, certain, and then you estimate that in between the units. This looks like about a, a half of the distance between them. So the last digit would be that estimate. That way, when a scientist or sees your value, they assume that these are certain and that one's uncertain. That's the one that you're guessing at. Oh, here's an example. So if we come down to this, this nail and measure the nail length, uh, it's between 2.8 and 2.9, right? And uh, it's saying that the difference between the two is a half of that. Actually, this has got a, this has a, an actual measurement. So you're actually wasting a value, right? The certain ones are ones that have a, a marking that you can compare it to, right? So I would say that 2.85 was an incomplete number. Those are only certain values because you actually have a designated value there for that five. So if it were exactly on the five and you thought it was there, what would be your uncertain digit that you add to that number? You add a zero because you think it hasn't deviated any from that five. Okay. If you just report 2.85, they're gonna assume that that five is an uncertain number, but it's really not. So this slide is, is in error in my mind because it doesn't give you that, that last guess. But if we assume, right, if we see that number, as a scientist, we're gonna say 2.8 are the certain digits and five is the uncertain digit. If that's the way you report it, that's what we're gonna look at. That's how we're gonna see it. Okay, so, more definitions. In popular media, these two words, accuracy and precision, are treated as interchangeable. They mean the same thing. In the sciences, they mean two entirely different things. Accuracy is an expression of how close your measurement is to the true value, if you know what the true value is. Other, otherwise, if you don't know what the true value is, how close is it to an accepted value? And that's more common. An accepted value may be an average of numbers that are agreed upon by a group of researchers. Right, so that's your accepted value. Now, how accurate is your measurement? Precision means um, what's the distribution of your measurements? If you make two or more measurements, are they bundled tightly together 
very precise by this definition? Or are they spread way apart? They're very imprecise. So I think I've got a, okay. Here's my analogy. Say this is a, a, a target. You're shooting at the target with your rifle or your pistol, or maybe you're just using darts, throwing at a dartboard. Anyway, in this case, is this an accurate measurement? The answer is yes, because if you average these four values together, they average right on the bullseye. So to, taken together, they're accurate. But that, look how far apart they're spread. That means they're not precise. So this one is accurate, but not precise. How about this one? Well, let's see. If you average these together, it's off-centered. So it's not accurate. Right? But the grouping is pretty close together. So we would say this is precise. Now, uh, if you're a hunter, you have a rifle with a scope on it, and you're sighting in your rifle before the hunting season starts, because uh, nine or 12 months late, uh, later, after you put your rifle up, uh, things can change. Temperature goes up and down, and, and it gets out of alignment. So you need to check its percent. You need to check its, I was about to make the same mistake. You need to check to see, is your rifle scope showing you where the bullet is gonna land? So you pick a distance, 100 yards, 200 yards, and you shoot three or more, usually, uh, bullets at your target with no adjustment. And, um, if they land very close together, that means that you're, you're a pretty good shot, but your scope is out of alignment. So now that you have this and the bullseye is over here, you say, okay, I need to, I need to move over this far and up a tad. So you, they have little uh, click, clicks on the, on the adjusters. They have two of them, one this way and one that way. And you make the adjustment, and now you shoot more three more, and that puts you right on dead center. So that's how you would you would use precision and accuracy to uh, sight in your scopes. In this case, what do we have? A very accurate measurement and a very precise one because they're very tightly grouped. What's the other possibility? Well, the one in combination I see that's not here is not accurate and not precise. So that's this one. So the average of these four would be over here somewhere and they're scattered all over the place. I wouldn't want to go hunting if I were that bad. <clears throat> Okay, any questions? As always, you can stop me in the middle. Um, I'm not sure how many more slides we got. I better get moving so I don't uh, have to run over into our um, uh, buffer day for chapter two. We're gonna finish chapter two now. So we have a name for the uh, individual numbers that are in a measurement. They call figures, right? So each one of these is a figure. So we have four figures in there. The question is, in scientific terms, how much of, how many of them are significant? And the reason we say they're significant is because we're going to do some calculations and we want to know how many of the numbers can we keep? How many of those figures can we keep in our answer based on what we started with? Right? 
So this is our method for keeping track of the um, the certain slash uncertain digits in our number, keeping track of them. So in our answer, we're not falsifying the data. We're not saying that our values in the end are more accurate than they really are. Okay, so here are the rules. First rule is easy. Non-zero integers, they are always counted as significant. So how many in this number? One, two, three, four. Four significant figures in that number because they're all non-zero. And there are no zeros in there. So all those are four significant figures, right? Keep that in mind. There's another example. Then you have, this is supposed to be a number two. I don't know how that X got in there. The second rule has to do with zeros. And there are three types of zeros. It depends on where those zeros are as to whether the zero is significant or not, right? So the first type of zero is the zero that's leading. That is, it's to the left of non-zero digits. So if we had zeros over here, well, that wouldn't make any sense, really. Right? We never write leading zeros with a large number like that when the decimal's over here. But suppose the decimal is there, and we only need one zero. That leading zero is not significant, right? But we still have four significant figures. We just don't count the zero because it's to the left. What if we have this? <coughs> Those three zeros are not significant, but these four digits are significant. So we still have four significant digits. What would that look like in scientific notation? One, two, three. There. Okay. And in, when you convert a number like this to scientific notation, you only keep the significant digits in the coefficient. Okay. The significant figures stay in the coefficient. So that means we dropped off those three zeros. They're not there. So sometimes converting a standard notation to scientific notation helps you determine which are significant. Okay, leading zeros. What are the kind? Well, there could be a zero stuck in between two non-zeros, right? They're called captive zeros. Oh, by the way, while I'm here, this is one of my pet peeves. Whenever you write a number that's uh, a decimal fraction like this, always precede it with a zero. I see students all the time, <laughs> they write numbers like that, 0.3457. Probably because they were taught that in school, in high school or grade school. That's what I call an orphaned decimal. It only has one parent, and that parent is likely to uh, give it back to the state. I don't like orphan decimals. Whenever you write a number like that, it better have a zero before that decimal. Okay, now to rule number two. No zeros are the leading zeros. I'm sorry? No zeros are the leading zeros. Leading zeros, yes. That's a leading zero. Now we're going to have a number with a, a captive zero. Let's just change one of these. There we go. Now how many significant figures do we have? We throw that zero out because it's leading. But this one is a placeholder for that position. Tenths, hundreds, thousandths. If we don't have that zero there, then it doesn't mean the same thing. If we take the zero out and say 347, that's an entirely different number. 
So that zero is important. It is significant. So we have four significant figures when you have a captive zero. Okay. And when you write scientific notation, you will keep that zero. 3.407 times 10 to the minus third. Uh, 10 to the minus one, excuse me. 10 to the minus one. Okay. And the last case are trailing zeros. Trailing zeros are significant if there's a decimal involved. So let's say we have more zeros out here. Okay. Those zeros are significant because they're to the right of the decimal. Okay. Now, let's see if I can imagine uh, what type of zeros to the right of the non-zero numbers would be not significant. If we said three, four, zero, seven, zero, zero. Right. In standard parlance, that would be 340,700. But these are significant and those two zeros are not because there's no decimal there. So that's what I was talking about earlier, an implied decimal versus an explicit decimal. That's an implied decimal, right? We know it's, it's, it's kind of there, but only an explicit decimal will make those zeros significant. Now they're all significant, six of them. Whereas before, there were only four significant figures. Okay? All right, as another example. Now there's another class of number. Called exact numbers. And we have to introduce this class of numbers. Uh, primarily because of the use of conversion factors. In other words, numbers that we use in the process of modifying one unit of measure to another, we use conversion factors, which is basically a number. Those numbers are always treated as exact numbers. In other words, they have infinite significant figures. In the calculation, you can ignore them. They, they impose no limits on the significant figures of your answer. There are other types of, of uh, exact numbers, like counting numbers, like uh, six pencils. That's an exact number, 2.54, when it's used as a conversion factor. Nine pencils, anything you obtain by counting is an exact number, right? Because um, 9.1 pencils doesn't make any sense. You know, maybe in some universe it does, but <clears throat> counting numbers are considered exact. Now, what do you do with significant figures? Well, with that earlier number where we had the zeros and no decimal place on the right, those zeros would disappear when you write your scientific notation. So if we had uh, two, six, zero, zero like that, scientific notation would be one, two, three, and the third, and then 2.6, because only two of those digits are significant. But if we had a decimal here, we would say 2.6, zero, zero, times 10 to the third. We would have four significant figures then, okay? All right. Uh, now, what if we end up with a number? Say we have an answer. Our calculator 
gives us, calculators don't do this for us, right? They give us as many digits as we want. So let's say we have uh, two point six one zero zero five zero zero times 10 to the fourth, 14. Okay, that's what our calculator tells us. If we know that we can only keep two significant figures like we did down here, then what do we have to do? We have to throw these out until we get to two significant figures, but we need to take into account possibilities for rounding. Right? So we're gonna use the simple rule. If it's five or greater, we round up on the digit to the left. And if it's less than five, we just throw it out, round down, they say. So in this case, we look at this one, we can only have two significant digits, which means we look to this one, which is one, that means all of those are gone and we don't change the six. Right? You don't look down here and say, okay, round that one, round that one, round that one, round that one, round that one. Don't do that. You just look to the one immediately to the right of the digit of interest, okay? So that's our rounding convention. There are a, a whole host of different ways to round, um, and some of them require computers, but we're gonna keep it simple. If you have a, a series of calculations, where you multiply, multiply, or divide, 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 it's best to do the calculations all the way to the end and then apply the rule based on the numbers you started with. And the reason we do that is it minimizes the possibility for rounding errors because if you have several steps and you round, 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 you could round up every time and your answer will be just way off too high or too low as the case may be. So what we need is uh, what do we do? How do we determine significant figures in the answer based on the numbers in the calculation, right? And for that, we have two rules. One applies to multiplication and division and the other applies to addition, subtraction. So the easy one is multiplication division. That rule says the answer is limited to the number of significant figures in the least significant number in the calculation. Right? So this example, this number has four significant figures this number has two. So our calculator tells us 7.381. We know that we can only keep two, right? So you go here, let's see, have I, yeah, there we go. It's a little off center, there's two. Well, that's not helping any. <laughs> that slide needs some work. So if this is our calculator answer, we say we can only have two, so we go seven, three, we have to stop at that position. That means we look to the right and find that it's greater than five. So that means the three is rounded to four and throw out the rest. So that's why the answer is 7.4 in this case, multiply, divide. The same rule applies for division, whatever the answer is, look at the numbers that went into the calculation and apply the least number of significant figures to your answer. Addition subtraction is a little bit different. Um, so what's required for addition subtraction is you line up the decimals of your calculation. Okay. Then you perform the operation, addition or subtraction, whatever the case may be, bring it down here. And then you say, what is the least number of decimal places in the numbers in the calculation. In this case, 
two decimal places for this number versus three for that one. So we're limited to two. So we come down here and say, okay, we're limited to two. That's a five. So the seven has to be rounded up to eight. And that's your answer. Now let's see. I'm trying to think of a situation. Oh, suppose we have, um, here's one that's not on the slide. Suppose we have two numbers that, that have implied decimal places. They don't have decimal places. Like uh, one, two, three, four, and then seven, three, zero. Add those together and determine the number of significant figures. Well, let's okay, go. So four, six, nine, one. We've uh, lined up the decimal places right here. They're, they're implied decimal places, but they're still there. But this one only has two significant figures, right? So we're limited like that. So this one has to be rounded. Four is less than five. So one, nine, six, but we still need the placeholder. 196 is not the same thing as 1,964. So we need the placeholder and remember, that trailing zero with no decimal place is not significant. So we have three significant figures like that. Okay. Now, um, we're going to talk about, well, if we don't run out of time, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, no, it's only 1030. We got over an hour left. Okay, so I'm, I'm rushing and I shouldn't be. <clears throat> I think that's right. Nine to eleven fifty. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the calculations you combine these rules because some calculations might have addition, subtraction combined with multiplication, division. Right. So what do you do there? Well, ideally, you will have parentheses in the calculation that tell you which ones to do first, right? Suppose you have uh, uh, minus and then divide. Like that. With those parentheses in there, you know to do this one first, and then you apply your rule to that one and then you take the answer of that one and do the division calculation and apply the rule for that one but what if you didn't have that one like that if you had well let's just make it simple if you just took the parentheses out now what do you do you go back to your math and use the order of calculation PEMDAS. Remember that one? Parentheses first. We don't have any parentheses. Exponents. If there are any exponents, you do those. Multiply or divide next. And then add, subtract. So that's kind of difficult to do this one, right? How do you do multiply, divide in here when there's, when they're like that? Well, what I would do then is split this into two numbers. Divide that one into this one, divide that one into this one, then subtract it. Okay, so that's different than the previous one where we had parentheses. And the order of operation will most likely give you a different answer. Now, Let's look at some real life. <clears throat> Say we have to measure out uh, a certain amount of a liquid. 
and we're told that we want the liquid. Um, we have these two devices and we're going to use both of them. So that means we have to add the value of this one to the value of that one. Well, which one is going to determine the accuracy of our value, the significant figures in our answer? The least accurate measuring device is the one that's the weak link in the chain, right? So this one is less accurate than that one. Notice this one, each one of these big marks is 0.4 milliliters. So that means in between is one, two, three, four, five divisions. So that would be 0.42 here, 0.44, 46, 48, 0.5. And then the third digit you would estimate. And I think this slide throws that one out too. So uh, just a, a word of warning. But this one only measures to two tenths of a milliliter. So this one would be 2.2468, 2.8. And then you would estimate. So the, the moral of this story is you're limited in accuracy by the least accurate device in the chain. So when we add them together, the total volume would be, uh, let's see, 2.8. And this one is uh, 0.28. Now, you'll notice that I'm, I'm throwing out the guess because these are right on the mark and I should maybe add a zero on the end, but it won't give me the same answer as on the slide. So I'm going to temporarily, I'm just going to say those are the values. This one is from the accurate one, the more accurate, and this is from the least accurate. When you add them together, you get eight here, you get 10 there, you get three there, but we can only be accurate to that place. So we round it to 3.1 milliliters. Okay. So the lesson of this slide is you're limited by the least accurate device. Okay, dimensional analysis. That's a fancy term, uh, and it, it has wide application, but for our purposes, dimensional analysis is simply another way of saying keep track of your units. Because watching your units will tell you how to convert one unit uh, number, one number in its unit, to another number in a different unit. Okay, and I'm going to show you how to do that. What you need, let me go back to nature. Nature says, assume that's a sphere, that's a certain volume. Uh, as far as nature is concerned, that just is. But we're saying this volume is uh, 2.6 liters, okay? That's based on our measurement, that's 2.6 liters. But we wanna know what it is in um, gallons, okay? What we need to convert from liters to gallons is an equivalence. We need to say, uh, how many gallons is equal to a liter or how many liters is equal to a gallon. We need that equivalence, otherwise we cannot convert. So we know what it is because we saw it earlier. Um, one gallon equals uh, 3.8 liters. Okay, so now we can convert because if a gallon is 3.8 liters and we only have 2.6 liters, how many gallons do we have? Well, less than one. Right. That's an estimate. But we want an, uh, a calculation that will tell us. Okay, here's the way you get it. Uh, those are units, those are uh, steps 
but I'm going to show you one. Uh, let me give you the discussion. Why do conversion factors work? All right. This is more important than just going in and using them. Why do conversion factors work? All right. If we know that one gallon equals 3.8 liters, that's a fact. Um, go back to algebra. So how would you get both units on one side of the equation? Let's say we need liters over here. So if we divide both sides right, by one liter, uh, excuse me, by 3.8 liters, 3.8 liters, then the liters cancel out and the 3.8 cancel out and that's equal to one, right? Hold on a second. I got a break for just a second. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I heard a I heard a sound and thought a cat was in distress. Okay, back to the discussion. So now we have liters on the same side as gallons, right? And this expression is equal to one, correct? Now, suppose we have those two point three liters, and we want to convert them to gallons. Um, mathematically speaking, we can multiply that number times one and we really didn't change it, right? So we could go like this, like that. Problem is, <laughs> we'd still have 2.3 liters. But suppose we have a, a way to substitute something for that one that will do the change that we want. So instead of one, we put something in there that's equal to one, and that is equal to one. Now, remember that anytime you have a number standing alone, it's always in the numerator, like this, right? That's given. Any number standing by itself is in the numerator. So that means that this numerator cancels that denominator, right? It's just like putting them one on top of the other. That one's gone, that one's gone. So now we got rid of the liters and the gallon is still there. So 2.3 divided by 3.8, use my calculator, 2.3, 3.8 is 0 0.60526, 0 0.60526 gallon. Okay, so now we have to decide, all right, how many significant figures, how many of these can we keep? Right. This is a conversion factor which means it's an exact number. It has no bearing on the answer other than the calculation itself. So we're restricted by our multiplication division rule to the least number of significant figures in the starting number. This one, it has two, right? So this one can only have two. So we need to say, okay, two significant figures Right there means we look to the right of the last one. That's a five. 
So I got it rounded up, right? 0 0.61. So what we're saying is 2.3 liters is equal to 0.61 gallon. And that's how we got it. Now that's how all conversion factors are created. You need an equivalence. Something is equal to something. And then you convert it to one so that you can use it in a calculation. Suppose we needed to uh, convert gallons to, or we needed to convert these gallons back to liters. That conversion factor won't work, right? Because gallons in the numerator and gallons in the numerator won't cancel. You get gallons squared. So we flip it, right? If it's equal to one this way, flipping it is still equal to one, isn't it? right? That divided by that is equal to one. So that divided by that is also equal to one. So that's why conversion factors, you can flip them depending on which one you need to cancel. So if we need to cancel gallons, we flip it, put 3.8 liters on top and the one gallon on the bottom, gallons cancel, multiply 3.8 times this and you get 2.3. So that's the story of conversion factors. <laughs> Uh, relative to dimensional analysis. All right. So we could do this one the same way. Our equivalence is one foot equals 12 inches. So we're, we're entirely in the imperial or English system. We're not using metrics in this case. We could have either one of these factors. Each one is equal to one. It just depends on which one do you need? Well, we need to cancel the feet. So that means the conversion factor needs to have feet on the bottom because this one is in the numerator, right? So we look, say, where are we headed? This is where we started, feet. We need to end up at inches. So the conversion factor has to be such that inches is on top and feet is on the bottom. <coughs> okay. That's the thinking part. The rest of it is number crunching. Okay. Uh, let's see, does my answer make sense? And does it have the correct number of significant figures? Yes, two here, two there. Does it make sense? Uh, seven feet, you know, I'm 5'11", so seven feet will be considerably taller than I am. Is that 82 inches? Well, yeah, because I'm um, 71 inches tall, so 82 inches. About, okay, that's reasonable. A little more estimation going on there. Okay, um, here we're converting from English system to metric system, and really, there's no magic. All you need is an equivalence, a conversion. But uh, if we're going from pounds to grams and we only have these two conversion factors, we may have to chain them together. Right? And chaining, there's no mystery to it. If we start off with 4.50 pounds, We could multiply it by one <laughs> till the cows come home. And all we need to do is plug ratios, which is what this is, plug a ratio in there that will get us where we want to go. We want to end up at grams. Right? So first thing I want to do is get this thing into metric system. And then I can use conversion factor in the metric system to end up with grams. So I substitute in here something that will get rid of pounds and leave me with a metric unit of measure. So 
2.2046 pounds is one kilogram. So the pounds are gone, but we got kilograms. Now I want to convert kilograms to grams. All right, top, bottom, cancel. Grams, a thousand grams is one kilogram. So now we've done all the thinking. The rest is number crunching. So you say that divided by that times that gives you your answer. That's called a chained conversion. And I've done chain conversions with six, seven, eight factors in them just for fun. Okay. And this is in scientific notation. And does it have the correct number of significant figures? Well, that's an exact number. That's an exact number. This is the only one that matters. Three significant figures, three significant figures. Okay. Um, let's look at it this way. When we're solving a problem, Anytime you're faced with a problem, you need to say, what's the question? You got to know the question. You'll never find the answer. So in this case, the question is fairly simply stated for you. What data do you need? What information do you need to estimate how much money it's going to cost for you to get from New York to Los Angeles? Okay. Well, let's see. How much money? So your end goal is dollars. Okay. Where are you going to start? Well, um, the logical place is to start. How far is it? Right. How many miles? So many miles. So then you need to convert miles into dollars. Right. So what factors do you know that will convert miles into something else? Well, with a car, miles per gallon is what comes to mind here. So, so many miles per gallon of gas. So that means miles on the bottom, gallons on the top, right? And once you have that, what do you do next? Well, how much does gas cost? like $2 and 40 cents a gallon. So we got rid of miles, we got rid of gallons. We know how much money it takes. Okay. There you go. So that would be your calculation. Now, as a practical matter, I used to do this fairly often because I'd make a trip to Atlanta where a lot of my family lives, or I'd make a trip to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I used to live for a long time and still have friends down there. I would need to know, all right, so how much is it going to cost to go from Beckley to Atlanta? I got that figured out. Well, I don't want to just get down there. I want to get back, right? <laughs> So I say, it's going to take twice that much. So I multiply by two to get down there and back. But I'm not just going to get down there and sit and wait to come back. I'm going to drive around a little bit because it is Atlanta. You don't go anywhere in Atlanta without driving. <clears throat> so I, I pad my expenses with maybe 10 or 15%. And that'll give me driving around money and enough gas to get back. So those are other considerations that you would think about for this particular problem. Okay. Suppose we want to convert one measurement of temperature to another. There are actually three systems that are important, that a, a number of different systems, but we're only concerned with Fahrenheit, right? So many degrees F. That's what we think of when we think of weather, right? What's the temperature outside? Well, if it's 
below 32 degrees, something's going to freeze, right? And I look out there now, ground's covered in snow. Um, it's not 32 degrees, but it was when the snow fell. It's only 38 degrees now at my house. But those are degrees Fahrenheit. That's what we use in the English or imperial system. The Celsius is used everywhere else in the world. So what's the temperature? If it's freezing outside, say it's 32 degrees. We know what that equivalence is in degrees Celsius. That's zero degrees Celsius is the same as 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We have that equivalence. And I told you earlier that Kelvin uh, is the same unit of measure of Celsius, it's just the zero point has been shifted. Right? So there are three different systems of measurement. And say we want to convert among those three. You need some way to convert. And in this case, it's not just simply a conversion factor. It's a conversion formula. The reason for that is um, they have different zero points. All right, so Fahrenheit is named after a German, and he was interested in uh, temperatures relative to living systems. So uh, he devised a temperature scale that uh, would encompass living systems. Right? We know that our body temperature is the, the normal for humans is assumed to be 98.6 degrees, um, but it can vary. Uh, so he wanted a system that would bracket uh, that number and, and others in that range for living systems. So he said, okay, I need some way to standardize. I need to nail down two points on my scale before I can subdivide it. <coughs> so at the bottom of the scale, it said zero degrees is gonna be the coldest temperature I can obtain in the laboratory. So he took distilled water and ice that was, um, actually, he took distilled water and saturated it with sodium chloride. Then he put ice in it until the ice stopped melting. So that's as cold as you can get with using saturated uh, ice water. Sodium chloride saturated ice water is zero degrees. Then he wanted the, the hottest temperature he could come up with. And it turns out that um, He used what he considered to be uh, living systems as his 100 degree mark. So they didn't know that 98.6 was normal. So he used 100. I had a teacher in, uh, in high school that told me the way he found 100 was he was married and he had done something that made his, his wife just hopping mad. So when she was red faced, he stuck the thermometer in her mouth and it came out 100 degrees. <laughs> I don't think that's true, but it makes a nice story. But once he had his system, all he had to do was subdivide this into 100 subunits. That would be each degree. And then he could take his, his measurements and use something else, right? So he said, okay, uh, distilled water and ice would be uh, 32. Okay. And 212 degrees turned out to be boiling point of water. Okay, so now he had uh, several measurements that nailed down his system. <clears throat> Celsius, I'm not sure who Celsius was, I think it was a Scandinavian, but he came up with a system for chemists. So he, he just wanted pure chemical uh, anchor points. 
And here's anchor points where zero was here for the freezing point of water. And 100 degrees was here for the boiling point of water. And that way, uh, any scientist that used his thermometer could calibrate it, could check it for accuracy. All he needed was distilled water, freeze, check that zero, boiling point, pure distilled water, 100 degrees. And they could see that their thermometers needed some adjustment or it was accurate. So that was degree C. Okay. So you see, now we have two scales side by side and they're related, but the zero point's different. Right? So there are 32 degrees difference here, plus 100 units from here to here, and 100 units from here to here means that the unit size for Fahrenheit is smaller than it is for Celsius. So um, you need to, your formula needs to account for both possibilities. So what you end up with is uh, degrees, excuse me, degrees Fahrenheit equals nine fifths degrees centigrade plus 32. So the plus 32 brings the Fahrenheit up to this zero level. And then the nine fifths adjusts for the size of the measure. Okay. I memorized it this way years ago. Your book might say this is 1.8. Same thing. Nine fifths is 1.8. And once you know this conversion, you can go backwards and forwards. If you know that one, you can solve for that one. If you know this one, you can solve for that one. That's the nature of an algebraic expression. If you have one unknown, you can always solve for it. Okay. So now we have one other system, the Kelvin system. Kelvin. So when we, when we put a number to Kelvin, we don't say degrees Kelvin. It's just number K. The zero point for Kelvin is way off the chart. In other words, zero in Kelvin is absolute zero. Absolute zero is a, a theoretical anchor point that refers to matter when it there is absolutely no motion, no energy contained in the system. And that's our zero point. And as, as a consequence, there are no negative Ks, no negative K values. You can't get below zero. Whereas in these systems, you can go negative here and you can go negative there. So that's the one we use. And this one is going to be uh, right here is 200 and, excuse me. Yeah, 273.15 K. So the zero point on centigrade would be 273K. So if you have centigrade and you want to know K, and for our calculations, we're just going to use 273. You don't have to use the other decimals, just 273. And that's how you calculate K. <clears throat> Simple. And the reason we can do that is because the size of the degrees the units is the same. It's just you shift the zero point. All right. So there's uh, there's what it looks like um, in a in a figure. There's how we convert. See, that's one point eight. I've got nine nine fifths. I erased it, but it's nine fifths degrees Fahrenheit equals nine fifths times uh, centigrade plus 32. And if you want to, if you want to know how the, this formula was derived, there's a good explanation at this uh, link. You can go to that link 
and uh, it gives you a more complete explanation than I gave you. Okay, so if you have this problem, you got 102 degrees Fahrenheit. This is probably uh, maybe Taos, New Mexico in the summer. And you want to know what that is in Kelvin. Well, we don't have a direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You've got to go from Fahrenheit to centigrade and then centigrade, or I say centigrade, Celsius to Kelvin. And when you do, okay, solve for that one, you end up with uh, 39 degrees centigrade, then you add 273 to it and you get 312 Kelvin. Uh, this is an interesting problem. Um, you can take it or leave it. Um, if, you, if you notice that since the degrees are different sizes for Fahrenheit and centigrade, Celsius, at some point, it's likely that the number value for each one is going to be equal. We just don't know where that is. But if you take the formula and you say, well, if degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit are going to be equal, then we can set them both equal to X. That's our unknown. So if this is our formula, then we can say this one is X and that one's X. And now you've got one unknown, solve for X. And when you do that, X equals minus 40. So minus 40 Celsius and minus 40 Fahrenheit are equal. They arrive at the same point. I used to work in a place and we had freezers. It was a hotel, restaurant, institutional supply house. And we had to keep some of our product frozen. Uh, some of it we would keep at uh, minus 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and others we needed in a blast freezer, we needed to freeze them quickly. So we had one that was minus 40 degrees and you couldn't stay in there very long, even with insulated clothing um, before you started shivering. So I was a new kid on the block. Uh, I had the fewest years seniority. So whenever we did our monthly inventory, guess who got to go in and inventory the blast freezer? <laughs> that was me. So I suited up and I go in there for 15 or 20 minutes at a time and come out into the cooler, which is set at like maybe, uh, well, I don't know, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. No, it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, excuse me. <clears throat> it's a big, greater than freezing. <clears throat> and I come out there into an 80 degree difference in temperature and warm up. And I go back in. <clears throat> okay, uh, here's a discussion on, on density. And the reason we chose this one was to show you that um, formulas, uh, particularly those that are used to define a derived value, um, are, are useful to answer questions. So we're going to define density. Okay, density is defined as the mass of any substance that's contained in a unit of volume. So it's going to be the mass of something per volume, right? So if we have one cubic centimeter of water, its mass is going to be one gram because its density is one gram per cubic centimeter. Or remember, cubic centimeter is equivalent to a milliliter. So it can also be one gram per milliliter. Okay, that's density. Now, um, in the sciences, we can subdivide uh, 
values, numbers in particular, as either um, I like to say intensity factors. versus capacity. Now your textbook and a lot of other scientists in the in the highbrow universities like to call these uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic. But that doesn't have the same meaning to me. I prefer intensity versus capacity. Now, when I say it's a capacity factor or capacity measurement, the value of the measurement changes with the amount of substance you have. So if I say I've got, um, oh, a bushel of wheat in a basket, that's different than 10 bushels of wheat, right? So the bushel is a capacity measurement. It changes with how much substance you have. Whereas the intensity um, is, doesn't change with how much you have. When you express the intensity of something, such as the density, it doesn't matter if you have um, a glass of water or a swimming pool of water, this value is still the same. That's an intensity factor. Now, most intensity factors are going to be ratios like this, but there are a few intensity factors that are simple uh, single unit measures, and temperature is one of them. So if you say the temperature of that um, ice bath is zero degrees Celsius, because it has ice and water both at the same time, zero degrees Celsius, that's an intensity factor because it doesn't matter if the bucket of water and ice is this big or this big, it's still zero degrees Celsius. That's an intensity factor. So let me continue with, with the discussion of density. Uh, there are the common units. There's your formula. And one thing about a formula is, if you don't violate any algebraic rules, you can manipulate a formula to solve the problem the way you want. So if that's the expression of density, suppose I know two of those factors. I know this one and this one, I can solve for that one. Or if I know this one and this one, I can solve for that one. Or if I know this one and that one, I can solve for this one. Okay, it's the same as before. If you have all the information you need except for one unknown, you can solve for it. And you can just plug in the numbers and then follow the algebraic rules and solve. Or you can solve first and then plug in the numbers. Say I want to know the mass. Density times volume will give me the mass. Now, check yourself. Use just the units. You don't have to use the numbers. Just use the units. Right? What's mass? Well, let's say mass is in grams. What's volume? Let's say volume is in milliliters. And density? Density is in grams per milliliter. So milliliters on top there and on bottom here, they cancel, they issue with grams. So you just checked yourself using the units of measure. Okay. Um, so how do we determine, if we want to uh, determine the density of something, how do we do it?
Well, you need to make two measurements. You need to measure the mass and the volume. So if you have a regular object, the volume is simple. Just uh, uh, width times height times depth, you got the volume. Or if it's a, uh, a regular geometric volume like a sphere, there's a formula that goes with that too. You just take uh, uh, the volume of a sphere would be four thirds pi r cubed. As long as you know the radius of the sphere, you can calculate the volume. But suppose you have an irregular object, a shape. It's really hard to determine the volume of that object. In this case, this woman is going, we need to know her volume. We can get the mass easy. Just put her on a bathroom scale or put her on an analytical balance that's big enough, of course. So one way that we determine the volume of an irregular shape is by displacement. She, if she keeps her nose and mouth and ears closed enough, <laughs> then no water goes inside. Then once she's submerged, we notice that the volume of water increases from that position to that position. The difference, the increase, is her volume. As long as she is completely submerged. If she's not completely submerged, then the difference is only the volume of that part of her that's underwater. Okay? So we'd have to hold her down, or she'd have to blow air out of her lungs until she sank. But that volume by difference is one of the ways. So how do you do that? We say the final volume minus the initial volume is equal to the change in volume. Goes there. Okay? Simple. Okay. Elizabeth? Junk calls. <clears throat> so if we have something that um, has a mass of 17.8 grams, this mineral, and we, it's simple, just, just put the sample on a balance and you can measure the mass, that's easy. And we determined that the volume is 2.35 cubic centimeters. How do we do that? Well, if it's a regular object, of course, I've told you how to do that. If it's not, you just submerge the mineral in water and it displaces. Uh, what if the mineral is reactive with water? What if you have a chunk of um, sodium? You don't want to put that in water because it'll react with water. It'll produce enough heat to catch fire. So what do you do there? Well, you submerge it in something it's not reactive with. Right? Um, sometimes you'll find that um, uh, in the laboratory, if the uh, chemist has stored some sodium in the laboratory, it won't be exposed to the air because there's moisture in the air. And there's oxygen in the air, which will also react with sodium. So you exclude moisture and air by submerging the sodium in mineral oil. It will not react with oil. So we would put oil in our cylinder, graduated cylinder. We would drop the chunk of sodium in there after we weigh it and see the displacement of the oil. See, simple displacement is displacement, whether it's water or something else. So we have this mineral and now we want to calculate the density. We have the information we need, mass and volume. There it goes, do the calculation. That's the density. Now we just need to confirm with these two measurements, which are not exact numbers, we need to compare them and say, okay, both of them have three significant figures, so the answer can have three significant figures. 7.57 is the answer. Um, what do you do with a liquid? Well, with a liquid, um, in this case, we're working 
backwards. We're using the formula to determine um, what's the mass. So if you have this much liquid and you know this density, then you can determine the mass. So the volume you just measured in a graduated cylinder probably. And then you use the density to solve the problem for the unknown. The unknown now is mass, okay? Let's see. Um, Brent, okay. So did anybody else show up? Let's see, there's, there's three, okay. So now we can solve for the mass. It's the one unknown in this formula. Solution is simple. You just use your algebra. Come on, there we go. And the mass is 42 grams. Now, why do we say 42 grams? Because when we did the calculation, it's a division. This one only has two significant figures, so the answer can only have two. Even though this one has three, that one determines the answer. Okay. Um, so if we're going to determine the answer in grams per cubic centimeter, but this is in liters. So what do you do? You have to convert that to milliliters, which is equal to cubic centimeters. So 0.125 liters is 125 milliliters or 125 cubic centimeters. Then you can put that in your formula. So we gotta, we gotta determine 125 cubic centimeters then we can put that in the formula and determine that the density is 1.95 grams per cubic centimeter. So you always have, that's the dimensional analysis part. You gotta keep track of your units. You gotta have the right units to get the answer that's asked for. Okay, so this one is a little more complicated. The copper has a density of this value. And the question is, what will be the volume reading on the cylinder? Okay, so how do you answer that? Well, remember, if we're gonna submerge the copper to find its volume, if the cylinder starts out at 50 milliliters, When you drop the copper in there, the volume is going to increase. What's that increase? That increase is the volume of the copper. But the answer is, what's the volume reading? The reading it would be the volume of the copper plus the original volume. Okay. So all you have to do is say, what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for volume. And there's the rearrangement to determine volume. This gives you the volume of copper, but that's not the answer, right? We put that answer in there to fool you. The answer is that plus the volume of water. This needs to be in milliliters. Which is equivalent to cubic centimeters. Now the answer is 58.4, okay? So you have to be careful, you have to be very methodical when you approach a word problem in particular. You can't just snap it out of the back of your mind. You've gotta think, what's the question? So that's the end of the discussion. And we're finished a little ahead of time. Yeah, quite a bit ahead of time, actually. Now, those review documents that I showed you in um, Blackboard will give you lots of these types of problems to work. They give you practice. 
as will your homework will give you practice. And as much time as you can spare and as many problems as you can work will benefit you. You can only gain from working lots of problems because with chemistry, you really don't know chemistry until you have worked problems and lots of them because chemistry come at you from all different directions and be disguised in its terms. You've got to weed out. What's the question? Is the information here sufficient to answer the question? Is it simple? Is it multi-step, right? Multi-step complex problems are solvable, but part of the process of finding the solution is breaking them into manageable pieces. And over this semester, I hope to show you how to do that, depending on what type of problem you're dealing with. Okay, so I'm going to stop this share.